very packed event for you. From now right up until four o'clock, you'll have seen there we are recording today's session. Um, we opened the registrations and very swiftly we were full up and had to turn a lot of people away. So we're recording the session to allow for people to pick it up um, at a later date. So before I hand you over to Jacqueline O'Loughlin, Playboard's Chief Executive Officer, I'm just going to take you very quickly through some housekeeping. Um, firstly, can I ask, I think you're, you're all at hearing already, um, ask you to turn your cameras off. Um, and turn your mutes, your microphone off, please. That just helps us with, with managing interference. So fingers crossed we'll have no technical glitches and everything will go smoothly. So just cameras off and the mutes um, on, please. You'll have been sent an outline of the webinar um, with your Zoom login details, either this afternoon or this morning. We're going to present to you on the findings from a, a recent collaborative um, research study which aimed to examine the impact of the pandemic, the COVID-19 pand pandemic, on the quality of play opportunities within nursery and early years classrooms. We also have um, an excellent lineup of presenters who are going to talk about their experiences and their play focuses within their own settings. You'll see from the lineup that we've also scheduled some time at the end of the session for um, a Q&A session. So I would encourage you all throughout um, the session to put in any questions that you might have or queries or comments. If you would use the chat function to um, alert us to any questions that you might have. And we, when we get to the Q&A session later on, we'll try and address some of those questions depending on what time we have left, but we'll try and get through as many as those of, of, as we can. So just use the chat function then for any questions that you might have. As I said, we're recording um, the session to allow other people to access the webinar later on um, at, at, a, at a later date. So without further ado, I would like to invite Jacqueline O'Loughlin from Playboard to provide some opening comments. Thanks, Angela. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's great to see such a full house here and um, talking about something that's very, very dear to our hearts. Um, so thank you for joining us today at the launch of our play and practice during the pandemic research findings. I've been afforded the really, really great honour of opening today's event. However, I feel like a bit of an imposter as I personally didn't make any contribution um, to the study other than commit the time and effort of the Playboard staff team to help bring it to fruition. I would like to thank Dr. Glenda Walsh from Stramillis University College for approaching us in the first instance. Glenda is a key advocate for early years in play, and she did a fantastic pitch in providing the rationale, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, providing the rationale for uh, taking the study forward. Um, obviously, um, it's a collaboration as Angela has hi highlighted, um, and I would really like to thank the project team which included Glenda and Tracy Woods from the Controlled School Support Council, and of course our own research officer, Dr. Sierra Paolo Aspero, and senior management team, Alan Hearn and Angela Stallard. They've done an excellent job, um, and I think you will see that when, it, when you have sight of the report. This is an important research contribution. Obviously, the backdrop of the study is COVID-19. The rapid spread of COVID has brought unprecedented changes to society, leading to the implementation of severe measures and by government as they've sought to contain and reduce um, the spread and the risk of contraction of the virus. The measures adopted have included school closures, home isolation, quarantine for those most at risk, community lockdown and social distancing. The impacts of such measures have been far reaching and um, transforming the lives of individuals and bringing about significant changes to how we as a society operate and engage with each other. COVID-19 has changed and continues to change and restrict our experiences of the world. But perversely, and it's, it's a bizarre one here, perversely, um, the pandemic has actually shone a light on play, it's put a spotlight play. Every meeting we go to, every group we engage with, every paper we read, the topic of play seems to be at the, at, at the forefront of the conversations. So for the first time after being um, in, I'm in situ now 16 years promoting the right to play and obviously the organisation has begun for 35 years but we've never had 
the context that we have had now or the focus that we have had now, which is fantastic in a perverse way to say. You know, prior to COVID, as you could imagine, we had many arguments to support play. These concluded concerns about traffic volume and speed, parental working patterns, technology, etc., etc. You know, de facto, our arguments somewhat centered around modern life for squeezing play, especially outdoor play, to the margins of children's lives. We brought in many health arguments and educational arguments, highlighting that although children in the Western world are now generally taller and heavier, their phys physical strength is actually decreasing. There were concerning stats on, on, on uh, mental health, ill health, and we were seeing children at younger and younger ages presenting with mental health concerns, and this was very, very worrying. And of course, then we've got childhood obesity uh, sitting at epidemic levels in Northern Ireland. 25% you know, of our children entering primary one either, either, either deemed to be overweight or obese. So our message suggested that everyday life, um, everyday play was being replaced by highly restricted lives, indoors, on screens, and under the constant surveillance of adults. Children's bodies, brains, muscles and minds simply cannot do what they're designed to do. Lack of play leaves children mentally and physically unprepared to cope with life and it affects them throughout childhood and indeed for the rest of their lives. So if you think we were worried before the pandemic, can you imagine what we are now? We're very worried. Things have got worse. Or have they? This is a question that we we're going to be further exploring in today through the research findings. You know, a third of respondents had highlighted that children were getting as much play now as they were previously. So I think that's an interesting point for us to focus on. But there's also been a lot of talk about how children are missing out academically because of the pandemic. But they're missing out in other ways too, as we previously said. Play is strongly connected to children's well-being, and this has undoubtedly been affected by issues such as lockdown, lack of space, and loss of amenity space. The fun that we have when we play and the motivation to play in the first instance comes from being able to choose what to do, how to do it, when to start, when to stop. And as you know, play is very, very different to sport and other organised activities. Sometimes they seem a bit similar, but they are very, very different. Freedom and choice are what make play unique. When children play, the rules aren't set by adults. There's freedom to explore, to discover, to learn, and to make mistakes and learn from those mistakes. Today's report raises what I think is a crucial point. As a result of lockdown, many children will be playing at least as frequently as usual, but their access to the full range of play opportunities and play types is restricted. For social and emotional wellbeing, children need opportunity for all types of play. And we would suggest that there's actually 16 types of play including play with their peers and uh, in the physical outdoors, both of which have been and somewhat to some extent continue to be restricted. Um, this restriction is particularly acute when children don't have close siblings of close age to play with, and also for children who don't have access to outdoor space. We know some children who, you know, who live in very restricted areas who, who can't get access to the outdoors, and obviously the guidance around taking children out was very restrictive in and of itself. So there's a growing body of research, including today's report, that makes the case for play to boost the well-being of young children as, a, as, as this pandemic drags on. Even as concerns over lost learning, time and pressure of catch-up grow stronger, we know, and I think collectively we all know, that reducing inequality, improving outcomes and addressing mental health concerns among children can be as simple as providing more opportunities to play. Playboard was very, very heartened to see the latest DE's um, curriculum guidance um, back in February, you know, which established a vision of a balanced day where children were able to play, are ready to learn and feel able to reconnect. We felt this was really, really important. We've been several representations to the minister because we were really unhappy with the previous guidance that had been launched last um, August. There was no re little reference of play and there was no reference to using the outdoors. So this new report we felt was um, very, very helpful. Um, and and we, again, we made representations saying we felt that that was helpful. Also, you've got the latest report on underachievement that just launched last week. And it also points to more play in the school day. So we definitely applaud that. And we think we've got some leadership now, albeit with a new minister now to negotiate. But we, we hope that we can take this forward within the department. Um, 
more support for play, more training of staff for play, more understanding of the value of play. We believe we're at a crucial stage in the recovery from COVID-19. We're presented with a unique opportunity to act in the best interest of all children. And we know that being active outdoors, playing, having space, time and freedom to act independently, free of restrictions, children structuring their own play, children are able to flourish. So I hope you enjoy today's mixture of theory and real practice. I think that's, you know, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time because I think we really need to focus on what the real practice looks like and learn and share from each other. I'm looking forward to many further collaborations with colleagues in early years and the nursery teaching world. So before I hand back to Angela um, to introduce the, the next uh, round of speakers, I want to take a point, I want to take a minute and point out, and if you don't already know this, this is Infant Mental Health Week. So following discussions with DE, the Interim Mental Health Champion for, Champion for Northern Ireland, Professor Siobhan O'Neill, who works very, very closely with Playboard, um, has recorded a short video aimed at parents of young children, um, approximately in the four, not to four age range, although it's not really age specific. But as a mother of a four year old herself, <clears throat> she's offering tips to parents about what they can do to support the children's mental health and well-being and learning and talks about how to encourage children, and young people to express their own feelings and the importance of self-care for parents. Now, although this is targeted at parents, I suggest the messages and the tips will also have resonance with the nursery teachers, early age practitioners, and even you could share it with your own parents in, in, your, in, in, in your school setting as well. So I would encourage you to have a wee listen in and um, look at the, at the video. It's very, very short, but it's worth um, uh, paying attention to. So in my conclusion, I'm going to leave you with a quote from Frederick Douglass, who back in 1855 was talking about the immorality of slavery. And he wrote, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken people. That had resonance with me, and I hope it has resonance with you as we go through the rest of the day. I want you to really enjoy and take, you know, listen to the research, but also to look at the practice. And I hope you really enjoy the rest of the session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jackie. You've very eloquently set the scene um, for us for this afternoon. So thank you for that. I'm now going to invite Alan and Sarah from Playboard and Glenda, Glenda Walsh from Stranmillis to tell us about the play in practice research and its findings. That's great, thank you, Angela. Uh, I'm just going to share a quick presentation here uh, and then we'll get started off. Hopefully everyone can see that not clearly and you can all hear me okay. Um, as I said, thank you, Angela, just first of all for um, introducing the event today and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I suppose what we'll try to do over the next 15 minutes, Sarah, Glenda and myself are going to try to provide you with a quick overview presentation. And within that, we will outline the context for the play and the pandemic research why the research is really so important in terms of children's experiences uh, over the past 15 months or so uh, and how those experiences have impacted on their play. Um, we will look at an overview of some of the key findings uh, emerging from the research and we'll also highlight a number of key actions again arising out of the research which we feel uh, are, are important as we move forward uh, and I suppose the important thing is as Jacqueline mentioned in terms of, of play itself and, and many in a perverse way play has sort of benefited from COVID and that suddenly there's a greater recognition of the importance of play. But I think the critical thing for us is that we, we learn from this experience and that we ensure uh, that, that those key recommendations are, are acted upon as we move forward. In terms of the context um, for the research, I mean, I think we're all pretty well aware of the challenges and the difficulties we've all faced over the past 15 months. Um, however, I do think just in terms of the research, it's, it's worth just revisiting some of the key milestones which have really impacted on our children, young people and our education providers. So going back to January 2020, we had the first confirmed case of COVID-19 in the UK. And at that stage, uh, I don't think anyone could really have envisaged that we would, would have gone through what we have over the past number of, of the past year and a half, really. By March, the spread of COVID-19 had become so significant that the national stay-at-home order was issued by the government. And with that, we saw the closure of outdoor and indoor play parks. We saw the closure of schools um, to, to most pupils, uh, apart from the most vulnerable and uh, the children of key workers themselves who were able to attend. Moving forward then, just over 12 months ago, uh, really starting in June last year, we began to see the gradual phased reopening of essential services. Uh, within that, we saw the reopening of retail outlets, 
uh, play parks. We started to see schools and schoolies childcare settings again reopening uh, on that phased basis as we began to move back towards some degree of normality. Uh, now, unfortunately, when we got to September, it became apparent that we were um, still subject to COVID-19. So we began to see local flare-ups and we saw rolling lockdowns uh, within Northern Ireland. We had rolling lockdowns in the Northwest. We then saw a further lockdown for four weeks over the Halloween period. And across the UK, we saw uh, lockdowns really based on local geography and the um, growth of, of COVID-19 infection rate. And then finally, of course, in um, December for ourselves uh, in 2020, we saw uh, the most recent lockdown and the further national lockdown then, which was announced in January, uh, which again saw the closure of um, almost all non-essential uh, services and the closure of schools, again, apart from for uh, the most vulnerable children and key workers. But during that period, it became very clear to, to ourselves as a play organisation and indeed many of our colleagues across the sectors uh, that, that uh, there were a range of challenges uh, really beginning to emerge from the experience uh, for children and young people of living through COVID-19. Um, so we had feed in from children and young people, we had parents and carers, uh, we had teachers, we had youth workers. And we also had a growing band of emerging research really focusing in on uh, the impact that this, this virus was having in terms of children and young people's lives. And really there were four key areas really came through um, and, and for us it was around reduced play opportunities. Um, Jacqueline mentioned there the, the, the play types and I suppose whilst, whilst we became aware that many children, because the schools were closed, etc., they were still able to play, but they weren't able to play in the way they had previously. So their play types were, were very severely restricted. Um, we, we also saw then the reduced social connectivity. Everything moved online. We had social, uh, social isolation. Um, you know, we had uh, the various protocols which really restricted uh, and prevented children from engaging with their, their peer group through play. It also became clear that this was having an impact in terms of mental health and well-being for children and young people and indeed for a uh, broader, broader society itself. And obviously with the closure of schools and with the move to remote learning, uh, we began to see an impact on education and learning also. Okay, so why should we be concerned? And Jacqueline mentioned there, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, we and Playboard, we're a play advocacy organisation. We believe fundamentally that play is probably one of the most important activities children engage in. Um, so, so but really, why should we be, be concerned about this? Well, you know, fundamentally, all children and young people have a natural inbuilt desire to play. Um, and through that play, they explore the world around them. They explore the community they live in and they develop relationships. They develop uh, peer connections uh, and they develop key skills and knowledge that, that will support their growth and development across a, a number of areas. So just picking out a few of those, you know, we know play provides physical challenge, uh, which enhances in turn physical fitness, physical health and well-being. We also know that play supports cognitive development. Uh, we know it improves self-confidence and it encourages creativity. Furthermore, we know play is fundamentally a social activity for children and young people. So again, it supports social development and it critically supports particularly younger children in terms of learning how to deal with, uh, for example, um, situations of conflict, uh, sharing, impulse control and so on. We also know that play provides exposure to, to children um, uh, to risk and challenge. And again, that's a critically, it's critically important children, particularly in the early stages of their life, are exposed to challenging situations through play in order to provide them the ability to assess and manage risk as they get older. And we also know fundamentally play enhances learning capacity. We know it impacts in terms of memory skills and we know it impacts in terms of language development. In terms of the uh, pandemic itself, then what has the impact been on play? So I just wanted to pull out some key stats emerging from a piece of research uh, we carried out uh, last summer, uh, Playboard Our Voices um, survey, which was carried out with children and young people aged between five and 18. And what we saw in terms of the play experiences through the pandemic, we saw a 25% decline in time spent in active play. So you can really begin to see the impact in terms of the physical health and wellbeing aspect. Very concerning, we saw an 80% decline in social play. So when you think of all of those benefits children get through the social play aspect, we were seeing you know, a cut of 80% for, for many children. And we then saw the increase in terms of sedentary play and tech-based play, with an, an increase around 60%. And we also saw an 80% increase in solitary play. So you can see that whilst children were still engaging in a form of play, it was a different form of play, and it wasn't necessarily a, a positive form of play that would support and develop their, their, their growth and development. 
Okay, so moving on then to the, the research itself. The research was carried out uh, through an online survey. So we went live in January, towards the end of January. The survey ran just until early March 2021. And it was targeted very much at the nursery and foundation stage teachers. We had two sections within the research itself. So the first really focused on the impact of the pandemic on play practice within uh, nursery and foundation stage classrooms and settings uh, following the restart in September 2020. Um, and when we got together to, to finalise the research itself, we, we just had the imposition of the, the further lockdown. So we wanted to look at the impact of that further lockdown and how it was impacting in terms of the reintroduction of home learning in December 2020. And within the survey itself, we had five key areas. The first really was looking at the impact on classroom practice of measures to mitigate risk of COVID spread. So we know that the environments we, we live in, the environments we work in have all changed quite significantly as a result of COVID. You know, whether it be through more regular cleansing, whether it be through the use of disinfectant and so on. So we wanted to look at the impact on classroom play practice as a result of those changes. We wanted to look on the, the practical impact of on, on play and practice within settings itself. So how had play changed? What were the limitations that had to be introduced uh, as part of uh, this move to control and restrict the COVID infection rate? And we also then wanted to explore the impact on children's level of engagement, social interaction and emotional well-being. So again, very conscious from other areas of research that we were beginning to see concerning patterns emerging uh, with, within a number of children just regarding their emotional well-being and social interaction levels. And we wanted to really test that out within the, the, the settings. We then wanted to look at the impact of the second lockdown and school closure. So again, just conscious that when we got to December, um, schools and pupils were potentially getting more familiar with the restrictions, but then we wanted to look at, okay, a further lockdown comes in, what's the impact? And finally, we wanted to use the research to uh, really identify uh, any areas of further support uh, that would enhance play delivery within settings themselves. But just in terms of the respondents then, uh, we had 291 fully completed responses. We had uh, 499 uh, returns, but when we went through them for the, uh, just for, for accuracy purposes, we, we restricted the survey or the, the, the research itself to the 291 which were fully completed. Within those, we had a breakdown really of 37.1% of the respondents were from nursery settings, 29.4% from primary one and 21.2% from primary two. Well, we were also interested in terms of the years of teaching experience uh, amongst the participant group themselves. So as you can see, really, if you look at the orange and the blue bars, there are just over 50% really coming in with over 16 years of experience within the, the, the teaching industry, 36% uh, uh, six to 15 years and 11% less than five years. Okay, so I just pass over then to um, Sarah, who's going to take us through some of the key findings emerging. Hi everyone. Um, I hope you can see me and hear me all right. Um, so yes, as Alan said, I will present some of the key findings of our research. In the slides that are coming up, you will see that we have included the main points of um, the summary report and the big report, and then some of the quotes that we thought it would be, they would be more illustrative and strengthening of the points that we're bringing forward here to you. Um, right, so let's start with this. Um, in terms of the impact that the COVID-19 restrictions have had or are having in, on children in terms of like the changes that did happen in settings, there were mixed responses from the respondents as to the impact that these measures have had in the classroom and on children. The majority of the respondents, 58.6%, as you can see here on the screen, have not, were the opinion that um, such measures have impacted negatively on the children in terms of their social skills because they can mix with the other um, classrooms or they can play together in the playgrounds and they have to stay in their bubbles. Their levels of independence, their ability to stay on task um, and overall enhance anxiety. In some of the cases, cases sorry, even obsessive behaviors, mostly related with um, hand washing and cleaning. Um, a sizable mi minority um, have 41.4% adopted a more positive stand in relation to this, um, indicating that the children were more independent in terms of self-care routines, they were more settled in class, they were happier and they were more relaxed, and displayed increased levels of resilience and coping skills to manage this um, new experience that they were living in. Um, 
This difference in between the more negative stand and the positive stand was noted by some um, respondents or some teachers of being a result of the children having to spend more time with their families, with their siblings, with their carers. Therefore, they were more relaxed and they were more ready to take part in the playful experiences that they had in the settings or even to engage with the adults or with the children or in their own way of playing. As we can see here on the screen, there are a couple of quotes. Um, on the more negative um, stand, there was a nursery, nursery teacher sorry, that said, I noticed a great difference in the children's self-care and independent skills and found that they were much more reliant on adults in the setting. On the positive side, there was another nursery teacher that said, the children settle more easily than any other year. And I think it was because both parents and children were ready to be apart after a long time together in lockdown. Another key aspect that uh, we were analyzing was the relation in within the impact that those restrictions were having on play in practice. Um, the survey highlighted, again, two kind of trends, one more positive and another one more negative. Um, some of the changes uh, to play in practice were required to ensure the health and safety of the children and the staff, to reduce the risk of infection, Certain play activities, such as the such as role play, sorry, had been had to be removed from the setting. As did um, other play resources, for example, sand or play doh. This was a bit more um, noticeable at the beginning during the first lockdown, and then in the second lockdown, a lot of teachers were telling us that um, because the guidance have changed, or because they had found ways of um, making all the materials and the resources safer for the children that had introduced some of these um, materials or some of these play types back into the settings after the second lockdown. Um, a sizable, sorry, despite the negative impacts, a significant finding from the play in practice during the pandemic um, is the high level of creativity and improvisation and dedication invested for the part of early year teachers to ensure that young children um, were still having the opportunity to engage in purposeful, playful experiences. Almost two thirds of the respondents, they reported that they were making greater use of the outdoors, they were making better use of disposable and nat natural materials, and they were using um, plastic resources for, easy, for easier clean, well, they were easier to clean. Um, there was like a really kind of like illustrative quote here of one of the teachers that said, we play outside every day, regardless of the weather. Um, outside is where the children could be more free to engage in um, child-led activities, free play. They were able to relate more fully to the other uh, children without having to be like in a very structured um, play or environment in within indoor setting. The findings from this study suggest that um, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the state of play perhaps has not been as negative as anticipated. And this has been due to the initiative and commitment shown by early years staff to maintain playful uh, learning experiences in practice. So they made sure that the children were still able to play and they still had the resources. Although as Jacqueline said, maybe not on the same length of um, opportunities that they had before, but they make sure that everyone had the opportunity to play. On another um, finding, the impact um, of those restrictions on children's responses to play um, after the lockdown. Um, so we have here on the screen that 56.7% reported that there were very little changes um, on the children's responses to play and the children behavior. That children um, came uh, back to the setting and back to the classroom with enhanced resilience and emotional well-being because they have they have had this time at home with their parents and their siblings and their carers. Um, some of the teachers were highlighting the, the fact that uh, children were using play as a means to understand what was happening around them. So they were playing superheroes and they were delivering masks to other children. They were helping the children that were feeling sick. So there was in a way play was their mechanism or it is their mechanism to actually make sense of all this situation. And they, they seem to be very social and very engaging and interactive with other peers. 
some of the teachers were saying in this in this point that it probably was because everyone was eager to go back to some sort of social interaction with uh, their friends. Um, despite this, this um, these positive um, reports from the teachers, there is a sizable minority that respondents that express a degree of concern um, regarding the way that children were responding to play when they returned to the classrooms and the settings after this uh, long period of home learning or lockdowns that, that they had experienced. There was reduced social interaction during play, there was less sharing, there was less turn taking, there were more problems in terms of, um, or conflicts in between peers in terms of uh, sharing toys or playing together, um, collaborative play was being reduced. There was an increase of uh, levels of anxiety. This, this came both from separation anxiety with the parents or attachment anxiety because they, they weren't used to be in this new setting, but also with it being like, oh, but also, sorry, with being in within large groups of people and large groups of children. Um, some, some teachers were saying that, that the children in their classrooms, they didn't really know how to relate to each other anymore. Um, there was a lot of comments saying that the children needed a lot of adult reassurance, even in the simpler, simplest tasks um, as uh, self-care routines or getting ready to go outside or even um, playing with toys. And some of them had even forgotten the classroom routines, so they were feeling lost and anxious because they weren't understanding what was happening in, within the classroom. Um, so here, one of the quotes uh, in, the, in this second um, trend saying that requiring constant reassurance, having emotional meltdowns with no triggers and having attachment and separation issues. That was a quote from a nursery teacher. Uh, now, Glenda will come up here and talk to you about some other findings we have found. Hello, everyone. Well, I'm going to share with you the, the, the final aspect um, of our findings with a particular focus on the impact of, further, of a further lockdown on um, learning experiences. And there were two key issues that came to the fore um, with regard to the responses that we received from the foundation stage and nursery teachers. Um, firstly, an impact on play. There were concerns expressed, particularly amongst the foundation stage teachers, about the, the lack of value that parents would attribute to play as a learning tool in the home. It seemed to be as soon as children get over the, the threshold of the primary school, that parents are more concerned with um, paper-based activities such as literacy and numeracy, instead of the, uh, attributing value to play as learning. So these, uh, they were, uh, the teachers themselves were concerned then if we had a further period of home learning that perhaps parents wouldn't fully engage with the play activities and it was very difficult for them as teachers um, to monitor the quality of those playful experiences in the home environment. As one P1 teacher said, it's very hard to get parents on board with valuing play as part of the home learning school day. Then linked to this then were the challenges experienced in trying to promote play as learning in the home environment on a remote learning platform. And again, this was particularly nursery teachers that brought this to the fore and um, that they felt that nursery children were um, going to miss out on really valid learning opportunities because you couldn't really expect um, nursery children to sit in front of a screen and learn through the, the, the mechanism of Zoom or whatever it might be. Uh, they also highlighted the fact that parental engagement is key to translate to translating effective playful learning tasks into practice in the home. And, um, and, uh, uh, and, and sometimes that was not always possible either in that respect. And children often reliant on parents having the time to engage in and support their play. And again, a nursery teacher saying, young children are reliant on parents or older siblings to help them with remote learning activities. 
Parents may be working or working from home, and it's difficult then to concentrate um, on completing, and I'm losing some of my quote here because I can't see it, children's work first, and um, they've limited time to engage their children in play in that respect. So um, it was a very challenging time for, uh, for parents and teachers alike in order to promote a real valuable, playful learning experience for young children um, uh, in the home environment. So then based on all of the findings that were generated from our study, um, we had six key actions, six key recommendations that came to the fore. The first being that need for greater value to be assigned to play in the home with support provided to enable parents to develop and extend play within the home environment. And again, a, a lovely quotation from a nursery teacher, there needs to be an advertising campaign aimed at parents to emphasize the value of play, especially during this lockdown. Parents do not want to play with their children. Instead, they want us to forward worksheets like the primary schools are doing. So we really need to be um, supporting our parents to develop um, and deliver play within the home environment. Secondly, then a need for further guidance on managing play and practice as we move through the pandemic. Teachers felt, um, early years teachers felt a little bit left to their own devices in that respect, um, in terms of how to, uh, uh, to ensure effective um, play and practice during this time, and um, during the lockdown time, and they felt that they needed um, more support and guidance on how that can be managed effectively. Then a need to prioritise outdoor play and outdoor learning in the school environment post-pandemic. We have learned how um, important the outdoors has been throughout the COVID period. And it's important that then that we embrace these lessons learned and continue to offer children these playful opportunities in the outdoors. Then uh, a need for professional development in the early years. We need uh, training on children's mental health and well-being and mechanisms to help improving it or maintaining it within the school context. Further training on outdoor learning, its conceptual underpinnings, as well as methods and techniques for best practice. And then training on therapeutic play, its conceptual understandings, underpinnings, as well as methods and techniques for best practice. Then number five, a need for further research into the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on children's holistic learning and development. We appreciate that what we have done is really quite small in scale. And we really need something of a more um, rigorous and longitudinal nature to gain a more comprehensive understanding of the long term impact of COVID-19 on children's holistic learning and development. And then last but not least, Jacqueline has already shared with us how um, COVID-19 has done many terrible things, but one positive thing that has come to the fore is the value that has been attributed to play um, for children's learning and development. And therefore our final recommendation is that we need to prioritize play more fully in practice across schools and early year settings post pandemic. Thank you very much. And at this juncture, I now pass back to Angela. Linda. Thank you all. Um, yeah, lots of food for thought there. Lots of positives um, and lots of challenges and lots of strong messages contained within those final recommendations. So thank you for giving us that overview. The research report as we speak is hot off the press. I've just literally had a message a few moments ago to say the final version is ready. Um, so we will be sending that out to all delegates tomorrow. So we'll send that out to the email addresses that we have for you. Um, but it also will be on the collective um, organisations websites and it will be being shared um, through social media. So you can watch out for that. There's a summary report um, and then there's a fuller report. So thank you guys. Um, just a wee reminder that if you have any questions or comments, do please pop them into the chat function there for us. That would be great. I'm now going to invite our panel of speakers to tell us their stories. Um, you're about to hear from either principals or teachers or both um, who, like others, have been at the cold face uh, during the pandemic. 
and who want to share some of their tips and some of their ideas and some of their examples. We're very grateful to all of them for joining us this afternoon. So first up is Pam Laurie. Pam is um, a teaching principal at Killyleigh Primary School. So I'll hand over to you, Pam. Okay, thank you very much, Angela. Well, I'm delighted to be part of this webinar today. Um, so I've been at Killyleigh for six and a half years now, and I'm just completing my 19th year as a teacher. And most of those have been in the foundation stage. Um, I'm teaching principal at a small rural school just outside Armagh with 81 pupils and present we have three composite classes. And I was delighted last autumn to be appointed to the board of directors to play board and I, um, which further leads into my passion for outdoor learning. I'm also a keen gardener and I think that has really impacted on um, my own teaching. I always look for ways to use the outdoors for learning and teaching. So four years ago, we started to develop our outdoor play in foundation stage, and we have been showcasing that to over 65 schools through the shared education programme and supporting them on their journey. Um, and then, of course, we've now looked to progress from the play into the whole skill development of, of outdoor learning. And we started off really by using termly outdoor math days. So the PE equipment would come out, clipboards would come out, and the school really was a buzz on those days with so much fun and so much enjoyment. Um, then of course, as we know, COVID hit. And as a medic, we, we stayed open as a learning hub and that gave me a lot of time when I was in with the children to look at our provision and think of how we were going to cope when we came back in September. Um, so we decided as a staff, as a mitigation against COVID, that we would move to outdoor learning. Uh, we installed another extra outdoor classroom. Um, we covered our canopy area to make it um, a useful space. And up to Christmas before the second lockdown, our foundation stage were actually out for 80 to 90 percent of the time. Our key stage one were out for about 50 percent and Key Stage 2 out for around 30% of the time. So we were very pleased that we managed to do that. As we've all heard recently about the Northern Ireland research on childhood obesity, dwindling mental health and children's lack of opportunities to play, outdoor learning is a fantastic tool to use for increasing motivation, engagement, the behaviour problems lessen, they're actively moving about, and certainly increases their confidence and their creativity. And when we had our P1 children in up till December, we noticed that they actually knew their numbers and their sounds so much better because we were, they were exposed to it so much through their play. So my presentation today, um, let me just try and share my screen. I want to focus on our whole school outdoor learning. Um, through playful opportunities for our children. Hopefully you can all see that. Um, so the quotation that's here, um, the best classroom and the richest cupboard are roofed only by the sky. What you will find is when you move to outdoor learning, you're not taking what you did inside out, you're looking at different ways to do the same thing. And it's so much cheaper because all the resources are there, they're natural, they're free. So every school I appreciate is different and you're all coming from a different perspective. You have different staff, you have different resources, you have different setups. But I would encourage you just to have a look at what's out and about and to make a small start. So as I said before, we're a small rural primary school, 81 pupils. And we're very fortunate we have extensive grounds, including a sensory garden, wildlife garden, grass pitch, woodland area and a willow dome. So our foundation stage outdoor play is well now developed and then we use our outdoor miles days whole school and our next logical step then was to move to whole school outdoor learning. So get prepared. We, our children come in foundation stage to key stage one, they get changed into their welly boots and their outdoor trousers in the morning. So we are out no matter what the weather is. 
um, you need to think about the resources that you're using. So last summer I was down collecting stones and pebbles at the beach. I collected pine cones, we collected sticks, we got logs cut, you know, all those natural resources, as well as your loose parts, your crates, your pallets, your drain pipes, all those things that are free. You'll need to consider the storage and you'll need to consider some sort of cover when the weather is inclement because you don't want to disrupt your, your learning by having to run inside. So in our outdoor numeracy, we use a lot of natural resources. So this was just a um, tree that my husband was able to cut into slices and out came the pens and I made number lines using wooden sticks and the children spend ages making up their number lines and what we find as you can see in the child on the left here you know he's checking it against the number line and there, there's so many uses that we have found for resources like these and the children will lift them during play and use them themselves which we love using natural resources so this is a very simple little activity at the start of the year where they were using the tweezers so you're getting your little pincer grips going they were doing a sorting activity, so you can see in the bottom right hand corner the little box with the shells and the conkers and things. Lots of talk around all of those, you know, the best conker and the shiniest stone, as well as sorting them out and sorting them out for numbers one, two and three. So that was a really engaging little activity, very easy to set up and change as you go through your number line. Using resources that you have, so obviously you may not have all natural stuff, so using some of the resources that you have, the bigger the better is good, and bringing them outside. So here there's a P2 class, we're doing their little subtraction, uh, we had the hedgehog out and he was eating the, the conkers and the pine cones and they were taking them away, so it was a lovely fun activity. And what we find is once we have done that in our class, in our learning outside, the children then continued that during their play. They were the teachers and they brought the clipboards out, which was great. We love mud and the kids love the mud and our parents are quite happy that our, their children go home dirty because they know they're enjoying their learning. So just thinking of different ways that you can use the mud. So the children were able to, it was a very sensory activity, making their numbers out of mud and then some of them decorated them. And for some of the children, this I think was like an uh, autumn day, the mud was cold, it was wet, it was sticky, but you think of all those sensory experiences that they're getting alongside learning their numbers. One of the things we did install um, a couple of years ago was our outdoor sink and it's become an absolutely invaluable. So our toilets are just off our um, canopy area, so we would have two lines, one lined up to wash hands, the number of times you have to wash the hands during the day so that was a really useful resource and something that I would say you should consider to do. So these children we were using the bigger so I talked about the bigger the better so instead of in a classroom using a worksheet the children were rolling huge dice they were throwing things at targets they were building up their own sums and what you find is when they do that the engagement is immense and um, you know, we, we did, uh, P2 were making sums with using three numbers last week and I looked around the playground and they were all fully engaged because they're totally involved in, in their playful learning. So up the school, we would have a lot of numeracy trails around the playground. So the children all have clipboards and they love to get out and about. I mean, you can use trails really for anything. So we would have used them down in P1, P2 for jumble sentences and they would have to find the words around the playground and then put them together to make a sentence. So I know staff are very creative. You can use trails around your grounds very creatively, very active learning, children moving about with clipboards. They love it. And here we're, we've just started to use the Pneumacon. So using those little, little natural resources, the stones, so this child here was just really experimenting with them. So one-to-one -one correspondence, putting one stone in each hole. And um, she wasn't counting them at that stage, but those wooden um, Pneumacon resources are a great resource for outside. We love our art and our craft, and maybe it's something that you would already be doing outside, but this was an activity I saw online and I loved it. So we have huge big pieces of hessian, which gives you like the background for your picture. So they were building their Christmas tree and there was lots of discussion and ordering of the, 
the sticks into order right to the very top and then creating their own little patterns. And that was a fantastic activity. The children were so engaged with that. Big is better. So you can see the children are using the smaller Numicon in one of our outdoor classrooms here, but the bigger ones, you know, having them outside. And I think that's one of my jobs this summer is to make a nice wooden set, a large wooden set and paint them for outdoor use. So some of the little things that you can do in your mass symmetry. So the children here, this is a P1 child making their little bug using the mirrors and sym symmetry. And when you think of how you normally would teach symmetry, it's usually a worksheet and they get the mirror and they look at either side or they have to draw the other side. So how much nicer is this and how much more engaging? These, these girls, um, P3, were looking at number bonds to 20, you know, so in a fun, playful way. And as principal, I'm very often in classes observing practice and, you know, how active is your mental maths? You know, when you think of them sitting, maybe playing some little games, but this is a fantastic resource that we bought with our wellbeing money. So it's number spots up to 100 and the teacher had put them around the, the, the pitch and the children actually were coming up with their own games. There was fantastic mental maths going on. Look at the picture. They're totally active totally running about it was fantastic and when the children come up with their own games too that's really engaging for them as well we um, have painted a lot of playground markings around so the staff got out with their brushes and their gloss paint and um, because produced playground markings can be very expensive so we use this one for our clock and what you do is you'll find the children then will use that during their play These children, P3, 4, were starting to look at um, their four times tables. So they were just using the Connect Four resources, but you could use stones or sticks or pine cones or other natural resources. And you can see under the background, the um, 100 square there, the blank 100 square. So coming out and maybe asking a child to chalk in where number 43 would go, where would 87 go? So I love this little picture because we have um, some little stones that the children actually painted themselves. You can see their numbers and the little spots on them. And these two boys were busy trying to get them and match them up just during the playtime one morning. Clipboards. If you don't have clipboards in school, get down to home bargains. Um, we have clipboards for every child and they're an excellent, um, easy way to get outside. Um, you can see one of our new resources that we bought was the 100 square there that they can chalk on. So some of the other playground markings that we have and they've been very useful and the children you will find will use them during their play and not just within lessons. So moving on then to our literacy um, a lot of our phonics, so we, I mean, we are outside. So you can see we have the Perspex screen, which we got through our shared education funding. Um, and it's great for practicing putting the shaving foam on or your paint. We would do printing on it. Um, and we had a really interesting one trying to get the children to print their name. So, of course, when they printed it the first time, it, their name was backwards. So there's lots of problem solving in that and getting them to get their name around the right way. Um, the photo at the bottom left, the children using the logs with the uh, nails in them and they were using elastic bands to make their signs. The girls in the middle were using the stones, so the M and the D, some of the little um, letters that they don't know just as well or find difficult to make. So they're just making them in a different way instead of the worksheet in the classroom. And then the group on the right hand side, um, P2 Phonics, they were using the sat pin signs to build words. So they were actually using and manipulating the large stones with the letters on them and then practicing them on their right words. So these little, um, I think they're little cheese boards I got from Poundland, Pound Each. Um, and my husband got this fantastic machine for Christmas, which engraves. Um, so we had a go at practicing it and then we used enamel. So that was good learning for me. But you could paint them on. Um, and we have the little talking tins where the, I had recorded some of the um, CBC words. And the children played the word and then were able to pick off the, um, the boards and build the little words there during their play. 
key words, as any foundation teacher will know, are the being of your life. So the more you can get it through play base, the better. So we would regularly play our splat. Um, so you just chalk the words that they're having the difficulty with. Um, the third child was the teacher. She, she was calling out the words and the other two were racing to splat them quickly. The girl on the left um, is one of our playground markings. We call that our empty ladder and you can use it for multiple reasons and purposes. So at the minute, you, the and my seem to be tricky keywords. So they were just repeated quite randomly and they had to hop or jump up those and say them as quickly as they could. P2 then took that further and they got the, time, the sand timers out and tried to time people to see how quickly they could do it. But you could use it for signs, for, um, for addition or anything like that. It's a very useful resource to have. So writing, trying to encourage children to get out writing, of course, chalks come to mind. The clipboard, so this girl was on a hunt for some of the keywords or, or some of her little words to make up a jumbled sentence. And the girl in the right, she's busily whittling a pencil and then she was writing her name in, in the mud. So very often we will set up a play stimulus for a writing that we're maybe going to do later on that day or later in the week. So to give the children a chance to rehearse what they're going to write, so the boys on the right here were setting up like a beach scene and this was a ninja crab with the, um, the sharks coming. So they were able to talk it through. So when they came to writing, they had their story already in their head. Sometimes we'll just record it for them and type it out for them. They don't, you know, if they can't write. We use our grounds then for um, storytelling. So for drama, so instead of the enormous, what is it? Turn up, no, it's not turn up. We had pumpkins growing, so the children all um, role played that, and it was great fun. And of course, we go with the children's interests. So, this year, we have quite a few boys who love their dinosaurs. So, we got the tough top out, we got the dinosaurs on logs and, and soil and stones. And then we came in one morning and it turned into a swamp. And then a couple of days later, the water had actually frozen. So, the value of that was excellent. Um, and then they did their underpants and we hung them up on the washing line. Now these were huge, so they, they thought this was great. And we looked at, I think we came up with about eight different words for underpants that week. So one of my topics, I changed my topics, obviously being outside, it doesn't really lend itself to some of the topics you maybe did inside. So we changed our first topic um, of the year and we just called it the great outdoors. And that lent us time to look at leaves and trees, to look at birds, all the things I think you maybe want always to do, but never get the chance to do. So it's like going full circle back. I mean, today we were out looking at different types of grasses and wildflowers. And um, so those things that you always feel you want to do, but maybe didn't have time. And this book, Fletcher and the Falling Leaves, is just a lovely book. The children were making their leaf wands. The happiness tree was another story that I came across and that gave us a great opportunity for making potion making and honestly I've never seen the children as much engaged so getting out the little pipettes and mixing it and then we recorded them all telling us what their potions were about. When the first frost came there was such great excitement coming in the gate because the spiders webs had frozen over the fence and the railings so we abandoned what we were doing that day and away we went to have a good investigation um, all around the school grounds and that lent us then to doing some what we call free verse so for you, those of you who are not used to that you get the children's views and um, you can prompt them and then you just put it together. So some of the poems that we get from them are amazing, you know, just putting their ideas. So they might say it's like trees. Tell me a little bit more about the trees. Describe them for me, you know, and you just just take their words and put it together. Great way to introduce poetry to younger children. So, of course, we want them writing for a purpose. We make sure we have chalkboards and access to writing materials in all areas of our playground. So in the mud kitchen, the, the girl on the right is just writing a message for her friend. Um, sometimes we have messages from um, the fairies in our fairy glen and they'll have to respond to those. They love those because the tiny little writing pegged on the tree. 
we look for opportunities to get reading down. So just a small corner, a small nook where you can put out some books and some cushions and a little area where they can read in peace and quiet. Now this was a couple of weeks ago, one of my favourite pictures. The boys here, we have, um, we got some stones and covered this area with stones and the, the mound of stones was so much fun, we decided we would leave the mound of stones for a while and it's nearly flattened now. But they were moving the stones from the stones, stoned area into the stone pit at the front. And it took a lot of rearranging, there was a lot of um, decision making, a lot of planning and organisation because the stones wouldn't actually move. So they, they got watering cans and they washed the stones down at the end of it. So what we do with, when the children are building or making something in their play, we then encourage them to do a plan model draw of, sorry, plan drawing of their model to encourage their writing. And they were so keen to get this down on paper. So we will laminate it with the picture of their model and their drawing on the other side. So they, you can see the picture on the left, the stone shoot. And then the boy on the right, he works with his granda. So he knew he should go to Cookstown and get timber. And it would have to be three millimetres by four millimetres. So I love that. So we love mud, free resources. OK, so using it for your mud painting, your animals, your bricks making mud hedgehogs. The girl on the top left, we were trying to get the mud to stick to the wall and we were looking at the consistency and a good consistency of the mud to stick to the wall. It can get messy, I have to say. And so looking at natural arts and crafts. So this was Granny's quilt here on the left um, and the children all participated in that together. And um, anytime in, an, in a paint shop, I'm lifting their paint cards, they're a great resource to have. Looking at making your own painting sticks and using um, natural resources. Just a few ideas for you. They have to get to learn to tie knots, that's all I can say. <laughs> so just if you're considering outdoor learning, you need to think of the spaces and the places that you can use. So this photograph is our cov covered canopy. So we were able to get um, side panels on that, like awnings for caravans. And then we have some um, picnic tables that we use outside when the weather's better. You can get tarpaulins or those tents, you know, and make, make an area where you can go to if it starts to rain. As you can see here, we just use spools and crates for our seating. Um, this is our Woodland Glen. So this is an area way down the bottom of our school that I only discovered four years ago and I wish we'd used it earlier. Um, and the children love to be down there. We do have our campfire at times um, and it's a great place just to go even for mindfulness sessions or lying on your back and looking at the birds and the trees. So we do use our bike shelter as well. You might have seen that in some of the photographs and we keep some resources in that as well. So I would encourage you certainly to have a look at what's around your school. Don't necessarily take outside or outside what you have inside, but let nature be your teacher. Get outside and enjoy it. So I put up my email address there. I'm more than happy to show anybody who would like to come and see around our school and support you in your outdoor learning journey. Okay, thank you. Oh my goodness, Pam, thank you. That was amazing. That's some lovely, lovely ideas there. Thank you so much. I think you'll get lots of people taking you up on that offer of coming to visit. I well. would love to come. Um, I'm you. very, very conscious of time. People, um, so we're going to kind of run on quickly through. And I'd like to invite Sharon Beatty from Dromore Nursery School to come up next. Okay, I'm just about trying to share my PowerPoint now, hopefully. Thank you, Sharon. Yeah. So we've about, we're, we're kind of very tight for time. So just... If you want. It's just taken that little minute like it did before to load my PowerPoint. So I'll just start while it's loading. Um, I'm Sharon Beatty. I'm from Dromore Nursery School and Pam's put me under a little bit of pressure to say that I'm teaching over 30 years and I've been the principal of Dromore for 20 years. Um, and I've, been, I've opened the school from a greenfield site. Now, my passion for outdoor learning has stretched back over 20 years. 
Um, from opening the school, I was fully committed to having a fully functional outdoor environment, which was planned for, evaluated and assessed at the same level as our indoor. So I was a firm believer from the beginning that it's not only, not only there are things that can only be learned outside, everything has the potential to be learned outside. Hopefully this is maybe coming up very shortly here. But from that, obviously with COVID and everything else, that outside became even more valuable. But we were, I uh, suppose, in a good position as a staff that we were already fully committed to outdoor learning and a real belief that active learners and I shouldn't stereotype, but a lot of little boys at the preschool stage, they really benefit from bigger spaces and being able to be outside. So that's what we're, and I'm hoping this PowerPoint is about to come up because um, I want to take you on a little tour basically um, on all the slides and all the uh, little short video clips that you will see of Dremore Nursery School in this all did take place in this current school year. So not during the first lockdown, but during the second. And as been said by lots of people, we've learned a lot from the first lockdown and we were a little bit more adventurous with what we were able to offer the children coming into September and even as we came back in March. So there's only one image that you'll see, hopefully, if you will see anything here, um, will be the Im one image that isn't from that current school year. Let's hope this is still whizzing like it did before, but let's hope it's going to... Okay, well, if you wanted to move to the next one then, sorry, I'm just, there's just a quick tour, as I said, of what's happened in Dremore Nursery School this year. So we are great believer the children are um, not only enjoying, but maintaining and caring for their outdoor classroom as well. And that gives them this sense of responsibility. And one of the things, and it was interesting to hear some of the research as well, that we certainly uh, we're estimating at the restart that a lot of children would probably have had limited opportunities to have this sort of um, ability. Sorry, I'm not ready to go forward. Are you moving? Sorry. Okay. Okay, leave it at that if you want. Um, the ability to decision make. So great believer in that natural outdoor environment then. So in that slide before, I've been very much using what we have in our grounds and the children taking responsibility for that. So if you go on to the next one, um, again, we believe, I'm not going to go over what the research has already told us. Um, if you just move along to the next, yeah, not going to go over it because you'll see that, you know, all of those things we were aware of, traffic, increased fear, media screens, children's, you know, exposure to risk and managing risk in the outdoors is significantly reduced and COVID had just exasperated that from what we could see. So knowing that all that was really important to children, we were utilising our outdoors from the beginning. Um, but again, one of the things we needed to do was bring on board the parents, because very much like some of that research, we felt a lot of our parents didn't really value or understand the value of play. So from the beginning, and this is a little video, and I'll get Tracy to start it if she can for me, thank you. This was put out sort of for parents to understand. Um, it's not going to work, is it? No. Well, this was the would have voiceover. If I, sorry, I can't control it, so you can't get the, the voiceover on it. But this was basically me explaining to you, this was a video for parents put out on our website. And I was explaining why we were getting the children to harvest the fruit and what they were learning from it. And it also explained to the children, parents then that we were actually not able to use this to make things in school with the children that year. So what we were going to do is we were going to get the children to bag up the fruit to take home. And as they bagged up the fruit to take it home, we put it out at the front door and then we provided picture cards for the children to use to make different products from the apples at home with their parents. So this went onto our website. Um, unfortunately, I'm not able to show you, but it had a lovely voiceover about what the value for play was, what they were doing, what they were learning from it, and how they were using this play as they went through um, sort of the things that they were doing with it. And it took them right through from the stages of picking the apples, washing the apples, preparing them into bags, and even at that early stage, identifying that we needed four in each bag. And the adult there is doing a lot of work with what is the number four, and even just being able to put four and identify some kind of number with them as well. And as I say, that would have been on the website for the parents to use to help support the learning that we had. Um, I don't know if you just want to move on because the videos obviously are not going to play very well, um, Tracy. So 
it's not embedded on your computer, so it probably won't. So again, we have these visions and values in place for Dromore Nursery School from the outset, but I think it really is important in reflecting on all of that value for play and the play that we use to help support children's return to school, really that the underlying bit was the commitment of the adults and really to be committed to our approach. As I say, this is a daily part of Dromore Nursery School, has been for 20 years. It's not dictated by the weather and it's not dictated by the mood of the adults. And from the very beginning, when I opened the school, um, I referred to my outdoor space as an outdoor classroom. And I think over the years, that's increased the value. And certainly coming back from COVID to reassure some quite some parents that were quite anxious about their young children coming into school this year and the whole separation and everything, using that terminology of an outdoor classroom, the benefits of ventilation, the, ben the benefits of being out in that outdoor weather that really did help um, encourage both parents and children to feel comfortable and relaxed. And it helped our intake and transition at the beginning when we couldn't have parents inside the building. Do you want to maybe go on another one for me? Thank you. So as I say, above all else, um, we wanted adults to understand the need for facilitating challenging outdoor opportunities and to be enthusiastic about sharing these, experience, these experiences, not just passive in them, because the best play at preschool is whenever the adult is playing with the children, um, not, not sort of supporting them in any other, we're just playing with them. And again, I'm not sure if this will play for you. This was just to show you, you probably not get the voice. This was just to show you an adult interaction and how we use that in a sensitive, but you're not getting the volume, unfortunately. Um, these little girls are playing in the wind, they're playing away, and then one of them finds something and she picks it up and she doesn't really know what to do with it. So she turns to an adult that's there and asks, and that adult then is able to inspire her to kind of think about what she could do and how she could use it. But it was very spontaneous and the adult is really part of the play, is not dictating it, but is part of it. Do you want to move along to the next one for me, please? Thank you. So again, we, we really encourage the children to explore at preschool level using all of their senses. So we're wanting them to use all of their senses as they explore through things. But again, this didn't come, this doesn't come just overnight and naturally for young children. Children are coming in from all sorts of backgrounds. So we do have to have a lot of routines established in the beginning so that children can have this independent quality learning. And it does require quite a bit of organization and setup from the adults so that when the children arrive in the environment, they can have this free play, which appears to be very natural and free, but actually there's quite a lot of organization and planning to make it happen. And again, space is really important for preschool children. They need lots of space when they're learning. So we use lots of natural things and we would maybe have four waistcoats or four sets of Wellington boots. And the children then quickly realize they can go to that area when there's a pair free of Wellington boots or a waistcoat. It also means too, they can use timers and self-regulation. But again, it always about the organization and giving that freedom of choice, but it does require quite a level of work to have it organized and ready. So when the children go out into it, it's very free for them to learn. Um, but as I say, the organization's happened with the adults first. Tracy, do you want to maybe move another one? Thank you. So again, we, we are very committed to having the full range of activities. So as has been said by Pam and by the reason, we're not trying to uh, replica our inside classroom, but we are trying to provide the same learning experiences outside, but with a bigger space, different resources, which wouldn't work so well inside. So loose parts is a big part of the preschool curriculum outside. We've lots of different things here. You can see an old uh, desktop being taken apart. And um, we obviously risk assess the bits, but these are real screwdrivers. And the children, the boys in particular, and a lot of little girls as well, really enjoy that real 
and um, that you could give them plastic nuts and bolts to screw together and they lose concentration with it very quickly. But when these are actually real things that they're working at, um, and we get lots out of this from their, their pre-mathematics, their language, their world around us, their fine motor skills. So we're getting so much from this. So we would have lots of this kind of junk stuff outside. And again, we've designated areas uh, where they, the children are allowed to do that so that it's safe and it's controlled, although they're not really aware of the control happening. Do you want to go to the next one, please? Now, alongside this, we also do have some group activities as well with realistic challenge and cooperation and sharing and turn taking as part of a group because obviously at preschool we are trying to we're, we're trying to get them to experience what it's like to be part of a class to be part of a community so we do intertwine all of our work with some group work and this is just one but you can have a wee go at the video I'm not sure Tracy if we're going to have any success but this is just kind of to show you the fun and the laughter and all that's really happening is here where this is in this term we're just doing a little bit of rote counting and with a ball in the middle very very simple but it's given a lot of fun but everybody has to kind of be focused on the one thing and I suppose for preschool there is a time and place for that as well where we need children to identify as being part of a community and it also teaches a lot of self-regulation and um, move on again Tracy that's great and um, so again we want we want the children to have lots of what we call free play. And we certainly, we plan for a lot of that. We plan for areas that are sort of natural, have natural opportunities for boundaries like willow walks and garden areas and some of our permanent furniture that gives us nice areas. So we would have areas for climbing, for running, we defined areas with small equipment, with quiet areas, areas to hide, areas to explore. We have large construction, gardening, and this is all sort of planned for to have set areas so the children actually can self-regulate quite a lot and they can self-regulate what they're doing. But as you can see from the top two pictures, while the bottom three is beautiful sunshine, it doesn't shine always in Dromore. I can assure you we have lots of rain, um, but we are out in all weathers. Again, we make sure the children have good waterproof coats, we have waterproof suits and we have boots and all sorts of things. And depending on the weather, we will use those. But we have learning opportunities with everything. So we've already got wet weather boxes, windy weather bo windy boxes, we have boxes for hailstones, the different activities that can come out according to the weather for the children to continue their learning no matter what it is. Beautiful on a sunny day. These areas at the bottom you can see are very much our free part of our garden and when it's when it's like that it's beautiful. They can take their shoes off, they can roll about, they can just interact with each other um, and sort of have their own free imagination at that point. Now in the winter that's very muddy but again we will go on on, uh, going on a bear hunt and we'll slush through the mud with our Wellington boots and we'll feel the difference. So the children are actually learning through their senses about the different seasons and the different weathers. Do you want to have, go on another one please? Thank you. So again, one of the big things for, for me is taking role play and small world outside. I find there's great opportunities for imagination, you know, creating things, construction, problem solving, communication. You know, it's really great opportunity to extend from your indoors to your outdoors. And again, I find some children who wouldn't naturally gravitate to role play inside because maybe their spatial awareness is not so good. The areas are a bit smaller, a bit more contained. Outside, when they can move a bit more, they can move to different areas with their, with their dressing up clothes and their equipment. They find it much easier and that their language development comes along. They're more willing to try out things. They're more willing to story tell. And these videos, the little pictures at the side there, these are the ice creams. We had a nice cream stall outside um, and the children were loving the play. It was, all, it was all sort of artificial things that they could use to pretend an ice cream shop. And one of the things this year we decided to inject is real experiences because we would have been at a school that would have participated in the Woodland School. We'd have gone on lots of visits. We couldn't do any of that. We were a twin school. We couldn't do any of that work or shared education. All of that interaction had to stop. So. To sort of compensate in that, we injected real experiences. And this year, one of the things, if you go on to the next slide, from the role play there, each role play we tried to take into a real experience. So after about a week of the role play, we then had ice cream Thursday. 
and the ice cream that used to was all just plastic and cones for playing with suddenly became real and we let the children have an ice cream cone each and they served it I served it and they had real enjoyment then the next day the role play was even significantly better because of that real experience and we've tried that with lots of things we've had pancakes outside we had a Chinese restaurant inside so we did a big pan outside with noodles we've done a lot of baking with the children in the indoor classroom which with COVID regulations we couldn't do this year so as a compensation for that we took these cooking experiences outside it was the adult cooking because of the regulation but the children still got to be a big part of it to watch it to hand us ingredients etc and then to sample some of the foods and that really brought a realness to our outdoor and we did a lot of picnics etc and brought a real feel to the outside uh if you'd like to go on to the next one please so again, for, for preschool, a lot of physical development is needed and managing risk is really important for our young children at the beginning of their educational journey. They need to develop body control, pulling, pushing, spatial awareness, positional language, and that whole range of gross and fine motor skills. I mean, movement is a powerful impact on brain development and all the research shows that that movement with the connectors and pathways in our brain is so important and some of that you know has been impacted for children uh, with COVID because they haven't been able to get out maybe to get some of these experiences so certainly uh, uh, in the midst of our planning with all of the other things we ensure that we have lots of opportunities for gross and fine motor play outside um, because we felt that even the children's mental health was not getting the same level of physical activity. Uh, whenever the play parks were closed down in the first lockdown, these children that we had would have been at that crucial two and a half, three stage, and they missed out a significant amount. So again, we built in as much of this and as much challenge and teaching the children to manage that challenge as we can. Next, Tracy, would you move it on again for me? Water play was also something we did have inside and outside right through and we decided it was under our risk assessment it was safe enough and we haven't had too many um, sort of issues with it. So I will maybe see if that water pistol one actually works, it probably won't. Um, I embedded this really because water play was a big thing but it just shows you the different ways you can have water play and one of the things that's always difficult to manage with young children is sometimes this fascination with guns and wanting to make everything into guns and gun play. So I decided to have a positive spin in this and in Drumore we do have things like the water pistols. We have a we have a purpose to it, you can see just on the ground there's like markings where they stand, there's a target to shoot at, it's fun, it's water, it's a, it's a good activity, the children have to share to do it as well. And the other little clip of it well, it was more to for you to hear, but you can see it. These are three little girls and they're just naturally in one of my flower beds. They started to weed it. But their conversation was all about, do you have a mobile phone? And one says, yes, I do. The other says, I've only got a toy one. Um, and it's a lovely conversation prompted by themselves. Um, absolutely nothing to do with any adult there because they were involved in a weeding activity. But it was lovely just that exchange that came very naturally from them. So I say we do try to add this challenge, challenging issues into our play as well and discuss things. And outside we find great opportunities to have conversations with children and children to have conversations with each other. Maybe go on to the next one for me, please. Okay. So I didn't see Pam's presentation, I assure you, but this quote is a, probably a, a quote for anybody that's passionate about being outside and um, learning with children. So, I mean, there is a need, as Pam has said, for consideration for storage and organisation. So actually outside play is not just an easy option if for adults who are trying to plan for, evaluate, assess and scaffold children's learning. It actually takes a lot of commitment to have quality outdoor learning. This is the one photograph I said that didn't um, that didn't occur this year because these are children at our forest school, which we would normally have gone to in a bus and, and weren't able to this year. But again, it just shows you these real experiences are so important. Um, and we do involve the children in our setting in tidy up. And it's not just about getting everything put back and using the children to do it. But that whole tidy up 
adds value for them and they know it also adds in the routines because then they know when they're putting the equipment back where they will find the equipment the next day when they choose to use it. So rules and routines, yes they are, it looks very natural and spontaneous and it is for the children but the adults have well thought through the boundaries and the supports that the children need because to have that quality play with risk, risk assessed in it you need to have to have security, the children need to feel safe and they need to understand where their boundaries are. So we put a lot of work and effort into that, but the children have thoroughly enjoyed our outdoor playground. We go on to maybe the last one then. Okay, so parent involvement, as I've said, has always been a big thing with me to promote at Tremor Nursery School, to promote why I believe in things like this and why we use our outdoor classroom so extensively. Now, up to this point with COVID, we have been able to bring parents in, to actually bring them into play with us in the outdoor classroom to see the value. But obviously we couldn't do that this year, but we did invest a lot of time and commitment of putting short clips up onto our, our website and our videos and explaining alongside what the children were doing. And we do believe this commitment to being outside had really impacted our children's being able to settle back. And there had so much disruption in their lives. It did provide stress relief and, and headspace, not only for the children, but for the adults, because even some adults and staff coming back obviously find it difficult um, with all the restrictions in place and the differences. This outdoor classroom just seemed to lift everybody's shoulders went down and we just seemed to be able to relax into our learning with the children. Now this video is supposed to sort of show you a link between the indoor and outdoor and how it worked. I'm not sure if it's going to work or not, Tracy, you can try. So this is the same group of children and it's kind of showing them one, this is all happens during one session. Um, and it can show you sort of what these children are doing when they're outside. And then as it moves along, it shows you how the same sort of outcomes are being achieved when they're in their inside. Generally, without COVID, my school operates as a free flow nursery where children can access both inside and outside for the whole of their session. Um, however, obviously with COVID, we've had to um, put bubbles in place. So the classes are out at separate times, but each class has a minimum of one hour outside um, in the outside bubble. And as I say, this is just one session. It's just a random video taken over the session of photographs, showing you the different activities that the children have been, were involved in. This was taken just about a week ago in the school. Um, and as it goes through, it'll also show you some of this. So you see the different areas and they know where they use the different resources adults are, are involved. And then you can see how some of the things carry back inside when we have the same sort of learning. But you can see the difference. Inside this is as much smaller spaces, outside much bigger. And some children need that bigger space and it actually really supports their learning. But they're getting a complement and a weave through between their outside learning and their inside learning in all of the areas. And it just goes through. I'm not sure if you just want to let that play on or... Sharon, thank you so very much. Another amazing um, presentation there. Apologise the videos lovely. didn't work. <laughs> no, you're fine. It's, it's one of those things with technology. Um, it is four o'clock, so what I'm going to do, I would love us to run on. I think there are three more presentations. I'm going to offer it out to um, our delegates. If you have other um commitments and you need to go that's absolutely fine but if you can stay on I'd love you to stay on to hear the rest of our presentation so we'll move swiftly on um, to Emma Corey. Emma is from Ballyclare Nursery School. Hello thank you thanks very much um I'm Emma Corrie from Ballyclare Nursery School, as you've just been told. I've been a principal um, in Northern Ireland for 14 years and I've been in Ballyclare for the past four years. Um, I'm going to talk to you today um, a little bit about working with parents and carers to support their children's learning through play at home and what we did during the last lockdown and what we've learned from this as a school and what we feel we'll be able to take forward um, in the future to continue to support parents with helping their children's learning in the house. So one of my top priorities as a principal has always been working within our local community to support the families with the child at the centre and 
giving parents the opportunity to see how they're able to support their children, that they are fantastic educators for their children, and also how good they can be at doing it. Sometimes they just need to be shown. So during the first pandemic, we talked amongst our staff about what we wanted to achieve for our parents and for our children at home. And we were really aware, a lot of us are parents ourselves or grandparents, that during the last two lockdowns, people um, had lots of different issues. They were trying to deal with many different things. So I've listed a few things here. Um, one of the main concerns for us was for parents and carers not to feel pressured, particularly if they were homeschooling older children and working from home as well. I know myself as a working mum, this was quite a challenge for me over the lockdown period at all, uh, uh, over the entire period. But, um, you know, we wanted to help them and support them. And the main kind of the biggest reason was we wanted them to just enjoy the time at home together because this probably will never happen again, we hope. And this is a precious time that they're able or they were able to spend with their children in the house. So if we can move on to the next slide. So um, when we were considering the kind of home learning activities that we wanted to offer to our parents and to support them with, we took in some considerations of things that we thought would be really important before we went ahead and planned any of the activities. Lots of our family have different levels of literacy, um, different levels of IT capabilities, different resources at home and also the resource of time is more or less for other people. I'd just like to say at this point, um, my school has 156 preschool children in it. So we were catering for a large number of families in our local area. A lot of the children have got older siblings that go to primary school or the secondary schools in the area. And another thing that we were really conscious of, as has already been mentioned earlier, that parents and carers may not see the play as home learning if it's not on a worksheet so this was something that we were really really aware of we wanted to promote the value of play but i also wanted to make it as simple as possible because we knew that parents were under different pressures and therefore if what we gave them was simple and hopefully things that the children could do with them and also on their own at home this would hopefully help them um, to organize their time one of the really important things I think for families to see is that we have to give children reasons for doing things and a purpose for their play a lot of the time. And also I wanted to be able to start to show them the links between play and everyday real life situations so that parents could start to see and start to value the kind of play and activities that they could develop their child's learning through by not, ha but not having to go out and buy necessarily toys and games and things like that. And along the bottom there, just some photographs. I haven't put videos on. Um, I wasn't sure um, about playing them today, um, but that was just some videos that were on our website um, linked to a bag that we sent home at the beginning of this second lockdown to support parents with some simple resources. Um, and we had some children in, uh, key worker children, and we were able to do the same activities with them in school. And we videoed them and put them all on the website so the parents could see the sorts of things they could do with the activities that we had provided for them. We can move on. So um, right back in uh, when the beginning of lockdown in January, we put together goodie bags because we were, we were very aware that some houses may not have resources and things that people could use um, successfully or would want to use um, or saw the value in using. So we just put together some really simple bags that parents came to collect, bearing in mind all the things that I've already mentioned. Um, and in the bags, there was a variety of things that we wanted it, the parents to see that the learning could be done by using things that they could find everyday materials and objects at home. So you'll see there, there was um, some collage materials, some stickers, we put in some writing materials, post-it notes, a chunky chalk, pencils, and then our theme would have been changes. We have very, very loose-ended, uh, open-ended themes in school, changes being the one that we would do from kind of January to March time. And that's where we would look at lots of different things that change, like ice melting, all those sorts of things. So we put in an ice cube bag, jelly, ice pops and porridge 
because we thought that would be something that we could base those activities around um, and for parents to be able to see the value in very, very simple um, everyday activities. Um, and as Sharon had already said, using real things is so, so important because we don't want them to be surrounded necessarily by plastic materials and toys or the loose parts and natural materials were also included in some of the ideas and suggestions that we gave to parents going forward. But we wanted them just to have a basic starter kit with ideas so they could begin to get the idea of things that they could do at home. We also provided them with a pair of scissors if they didn't have children's scissors at home because that was one of the skills that we felt they might miss out on because um, I know a lot of our parents wouldn't give their children scissors to use at home and we wanted to encourage those kind of skills as well so when they came back they hadn't got too behind with some of those fine motor skills as well. If we could move on please. Um, one of the other things we really, really thought about was promoting independence at home. And I don't know about you, but I know we would have a range of abilities in terms of what children can and can't do for themselves. And in nursery, one of our biggest jobs throughout the year is really getting the children to be independent, learning to do lots of different things, being able to put on their own coats, etc. And again, it's something that may not necessarily occur to parents as being learning. Um, going back to the whole worksheet thing um, and so we wanted to really encourage the parents to see the sorts of things that they could help their children at home and that these activities were really worthwhile and really part of our preschool curriculum. So as part of the pack every child got a helping hands at home sheet and a sheet of stickers and we just asked the parents and gave them suggestions that um, they could do uh, for things at home and then when they felt that their child was really good at something or had experienced it lots of times you know we left it up to them they were able then to complete to put one of the stickers onto one of the hands and then we asked them to bring them back in um, at the end when they came back and we've actually still got uh, parents and children working on these things and bringing them in so going forward it's something that we think we might continue um, each year as part of our kind of home learning support because the parents have all said that they've really enjoyed it and didn't necessarily think that that would be uh, counted as learning at home. So that was really positive. We could move on. One of the biggest challenges we had um, over the pandemic lockdown was how to support the adults virtually. Um, as I've already said, our parents, we've got a range of parents with different IT skills and stuff. And as a school, we were still developing our online platforms um, in order to communicate with parents. So as I've already said, we gave them the range of resources and they also received a home learning booklet in with those resources, just with some very simple ideas, explaining about the kind of learning that could take place and how it fitted in with what we were doing at school. And then, as I've already mentioned, we further enhanced this with online videos and all the staff were involved and they all made videos about different things that you could do with stuff that they found in the bag. And then as the weeks went on, we also developed this just with ideas for other things that they could do just with everyday household objects at home to see that they didn't need to go out and spend lots of money on toys or activities and that there was value in play around the home. And, you know, very, very simple ideas, but that the children could get an awful lot from it. And all these videos really demonstrated to them the value within all of these activities. So um, on the next slide, there's just just one example. Um, one of the activities that we did was during um, Valentine's Day week. And um, Janine, the teacher, did a lovely activity where the children just that were in school just collected red objects. As, as we said to the parents, you could do this at home. And then they made some lovely Valentine's Day floor art together. It was a big collaborative heart and they placed all the objects and talked about all the different objects and the, the different colour reds and the shades and the different textures. And then at the end, um, they took a photograph of their work and actually turned it into a Valentine's card to take home. And we were just trying to show parents the kind of value and also how you can extend activities and make them really worth, worthwhile. And again, link them to everyday activities and to just children's learning within using household objects at home and to see the purpose of it as well and to make it into something at the end rather than just packing it all away and saying, there we go, we've done that, you know. 
So that was that was a great activity. And there was a video on to show the parents what we've done for that one as well. On the next slide, please. Um, we also had um, found links to lots of core stories and staff also read stories and posted the videos online. And the children really enjoyed that. The parents fed back to us that they were really enjoying seeing their teachers um, reading stories and um, chatting to them online. We didn't do any live sessions. We didn't feel competent at that point to be able to do that. Um, but we also had lots of other videos and lots of links to other things as well, like Play-Doh ideas, excuse me, my phone's ringing, activities um, to do with loose parts. And as Sharon has already talked about, encouraging families to get outside um, using natural resources, loose parts to enhance learning um, and different learning opportunities. Our families also had the opportunity to upload and message us via our app and they were able to receive messages back from their teachers. So we were able to see all the lovely things that everybody was doing and everybody really engaged really nicely in all of those things. Um, I'm nearly done because I'm, I'm very conscious of the time. If we could go on to the next slide. Just to say, um, again, I work very closely with lots of people from our local community and Gillian, who runs our local Joe Jingles, would come into school to do sessions for us. And she and I set up live sessions online and she gave me some worksheets and things for the children just to colour in at home. Um, so to support the session she, she did and we did those live on our Facebook page. And just to point out that um, in one of the comments down there, it was liked by ETI and I, so I knew I was on the right track when we were doing that. So that was quite a relief to see. The next slide is just to tell you that um, we do the big bedtime read, getting ready to learn. And we have got all our books online. We put, got them all put online for the parents to use at the beginning of the pandemic because we knew we couldn't send the book packs home. Um, they're still online. And we're going to keep those online now because we feel that that's actually a really good resource. And I, we know that a lot of people have been using those on a really regular basis. Um, and just to kind of finish, just two more slides. Um, the next one is just to say that I found that if you are sharing ideas with parents and you're explaining about the curriculum to them, the more simple you can make it and the more... Um, linked to everyday lives and things that they're going to know about the better because it really breaks it down for them to see the value of play in lots of different activities and the last slide going forward our ethos in our school is we always keep the children and their families at the heart of everything we do and when we were putting over these ideas to them and planning our remote learning we really kind of thought of three key principles Firstly, what did we want the children to get from it? Secondly, how as parents were they going to be able to facilitate it? And thirdly, how as a school were we able to support them? Um, and we found it's been very, very effective. And as I've said, there's a lot of approaches that we've used and learned about over the pandemic that we're going to continue to use going forward in the future to support children's learning at home. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Emma. I loved your goodie bags. No. Um, moving swiftly on, we have another Emma. Is Emma Quinn still with us? Um, yes. Emma, Emma <laughs> is from Rathbull Pool Primary School. Emma, I'm not going to put pressure on you, but I am going to say, can you do can you do this very swiftly? Um, I, I, if that's okay. <laughs> no problem. Just going to share screen. Okay. Okay, so uh, yeah, I've given a wee disclaimer to my staff today that we uh, can't cover everything in this, so it's, it's a good excuse then that we're short for time, so forgive me if I do rush through. Uh, my name is Emma, I have been teaching for just over 21 years. I came here in teaching practice, came here as a sub um, and took on board the acting principal role about six years ago and was made permanent principal through interview about um, eight weeks ago now, so it's certainly, it's, it's, a, it's a calling I think in respect of the school that you are actually set into. For me, I suppose being a mum um, really reinforced the need for play, the need for early intervention, the need for great support um, between schools and parents. 
I'm going to move on. This is our school. And whenever you mention you speak at Rathco Primary School, you get, oh, oh dear. And kind of the faces go, I I'm sure that's really difficult. And certainly, I mean, we're in the middle of a huge housing estate. It was one of the largest ones in Europe at one time. But we're surrounded by Cariff Hills, Carmoney Hills and a huge expansive ground within the school setting. We also have the paramilitary murals, big fences, and to be honest, it's not a very pretty sight at times, but we often talk about how we are more than just a school. We have over 150 pupils from nursery to P7, and our challenge is about how to engage our pupils, develop our expansive school grounds and really make an impact. And more importantly, after the school closed in March and then remained open um, for vulnerable and key workers, what we want to do to best support the children and young people in our area. We talk about that we are more than just a school. We're a nurturing school, we're a forest school, we're a Sustran Active Travel School, we're a safe school, and more importantly, with Shanine as well, we know we're a, a top award school as well. We have a new autism specific classroom that's just opened up in November time, and we're hoping to expand that special needs provision and do a second classroom in the new year. We've around about 65, 70% free school meals and anywhere ranging up to probably our most 60% special educational needs, but we live in a great community. We've got dedicated parents, fantastic staff, supportive governors, and more importantly, amazing children. And we were, our motto would really be looking at nurture, inspire and flourish. And I suppose for us, we started our journey at the TOPS Award many years ago. We certainly got a nursery two stream classroom of 26 children each and a composite P1 class. And I suppose foundation stage for us has probably been where we've made maybe the biggest change. Um, a free flow area was set up with a small group teaching throughout the day. We're using an unused quad area within the, within, um, the school grounds. For us, the children's voice is very much at the centre of what we do. And there are four articles, I suppose, that I sort of picked out that we look about. The right to play, which we know is not new, but as we've alluded to today, it doesn't stop in nursery, P1 or P2. It continues right through life and it adapts and is guided by the needs of the child. We have a student council set up in terms of having a voice to help support and guide what's needed and the children are involved in the process and particularly we can see Shanine at the bottom. She was a very important part of supporting that through her TOPS journey. We have a huge focus on oracy and language in school as well and creation of those safe places to do so within the playground and other areas and it was this that was very vital to have those spaces to meet, to reconnect for pu with pupils and allow time for talking and space to listen. Obviously then the right to education and obviously a focus on well-being and reconnecting. We had to ensure that school was a safe place and practice both in the environment and the resources that we provided. So planning, how did it all stop? I've mentioned Shanine and again she was central uh, whenever I took up the role originally. Um, it's like she'd been reading my mind. We were looking at play within her school development plan and then Shanine appeared with the TOPS award and play board support. So that was crucial. Um, we've also worked along with Bram Poots from Forest Schools and I know I've spoken a little bit on that at different settings before. We had two staff who were trained as forest leaders um, and the role this year before COVID was really to try to train up as many staff in school as possible. So that's ongoing and by the end of this year hopefully we'll have up to maybe 10 or 12 staff that will be trained. Our plan then is to develop that into training up parents within the community so that they then can come in and work with their small groups and classes and extend that in the after school provision. Communication through all of this, not only through COVID but before, was vital. Parent support, good communication at initial planning stages with parents, and the development of the play based curriculum. And certainly, Joe, who's our primary one, two class teacher, was fantastic in being able to do that. Class Dojo for us is our main school communication and through that, again, we've alluded to it, it's about putting up the quotes, it's about putting up the pictures, the videos, the learning that comes from that and that drip feeding um, of why we feel that play is important. It was really essential through lockdown and through closures that we work with the staff team across the teaching and non-teaching, not only in terms of training, in terms of modelling, but for many of the non-teaching staff, this is a huge change in their role. But many of them, I have to say, Sean, they thrived in the environment and were at times very often able to share this good practice with class teachers. For example, it might have been a shared learning board, a shared planning board, and um, that incidental learning so that we could filter that into future planning.
Communication was essential in terms of COVID restrictions, risk assessments, bubbles, and many of us through the remote learning, we had like a range of strategies almost or activities, like a learning menu for the parents to choose from. So we weren't dictating when things had to be done and when they had to be returned to school. We also built in two sessions, a Wellbeing Wednesday, and that was as importantly not only for the children, the families, but also for the, also for the staff at home um, or working from home or those in school, where it took the pressure off a little bit and we could focus on us. And that could have been through cooking, baking, gardening, um, it could have been through mindfulness, just going out for a walk. We did the same then on a forest Friday afternoon to allow staff really time away from the screen. And it meant then that families could work at home with their children. They could use either local spaces if they were allowing out their gardens. And again, a lot of activities were sent home and shared and parents were encouraged again to share them back. We tried to structure the day for the parents as much as possible, but also in school, give the non-teaching staff really options. And again, with parents, some of them wanted print out packs and some of them wanted it online. And again, we used our website for that. But again, no pressures were there. Certainly the Department of Education's quote there talks about plays a natural and universal drive in childhood. Um, through play, children explore the world around them and take and learn to take responsibility. So how do we actually then use the space? So time has really impacted on the space within our setting. From going from a vast open back and front to the school, we now have zoned areas through um, probably through EA Minor Works, through safeguarding. But what that has allowed us then is to have really a main playground. We've also then our separate nursery unit. We have, of course, then our forest school area that you can see in the left hand side there. And we're also lucky enough beside the nursery to have almost a little out outdoor secret garden almost area which is just lovely. Foundation Gain stage again is using an internal quad which was really unusable probably about two years ago but Joe has been working tirelessly in that bringing in tires, pallets, equipment, mud kitchen and again that's evolved over time. We have a new sensory garden, um, again you can see just up in the top left hand corner three live here, love here and that was just planted at the end of Covid, um, I think it would have been maybe in June last year or the start of this year. We've planted trees, I mentioned Woodland Trust to staff and they, they, they go oh Emma here we go again but the forest around the boundary of the school is starting to grow and with the lovely yellow flowers that are going up between it the school just looks absolutely fantastic now. We have a new fire pit there and we whenever we came obviously to look at spaces with the nursery it was slightly different so we had to actually think about zoning off the um, playground out the back which I know that that certainly has been challenging but it's also allowed the nursery staff to look at well what, what equipment do we actually use and how can we change that when what provision can we put now in place instead Sadly, we had a, an accident in the nursery now just last week. One of our, our, our placement students tripped over um, a piece of flooring that, that was coming up in the outdoor area. So we've actually a part that zoned off. So the staff just from Monday have actually been using the separate forest area. And one of the comments from the nursery staff just today was, Do you know, Emma, they haven't asked for the climbing frame. They haven't asked for the play equipment. They're just playing. And I think that there has been an absolute fantastic Certainly from the playground point of view, we would have had pre-COVID P1 to P7 coming out together um, and that was very much something which we wanted. That's obviously been restricted with the bubbles and it's something that we will come back to look at. We have outdoor sheds with a music station, um, a sensory space, a quiet chill zone. But again, it's constantly evolving and dear love my father, he's nearly 78 coming and he was out helping me collect huge tree trunks from a building site the other day. Um, but it's just being on your toes, looking out, seeing what's out there and seeing how you can best utilise it within the space. And um, again, reusing and recycling. Um, we have so much stuff over the years. Sadly, our numbers had gone down a lot. So we collated a lot of them. And I'm going to call it junk. Um, numbers are on the rise, thankfully. But what we've done is started to really clear out and I suppose repurpose equipment. Um, the collation of really recycled materials can become really overwhelming at times. So be very careful about what you accept and what you can use. But I mean, we have a fire pit that's made out of old bricks and logs. We've tree stumps from the, from the building site. But again, things do need to be maintained so the like of the pallets the trunks the tires they do need checks so those risk assessments and who's actually going to get rid of it is it like in my case my dad with the trailer um are you coming in a sunday to clear a space but it's just keeping all of that in mind
We did use a lot of junk material through COVID as it could be put out or brought home. And I suppose that idea of transient art really was built upon as well. And I think that's a really important thing for children to learn that when they make something, they can change it, adapt it, or it can be moved away. And again, the use of natural materials and forest schools. And I suppose thinking about how can the outdoors really enhance the play and the learning and making sure that it fits appropriately. So how's it going at the minute? Well, in terms of staff, it needs to be clear and purposeful. But for me, during COVID, just sometimes letting the play be. Yes, you have your focus groups, observations, skills, the surveys, but just sometimes taking a moment to stand back and listen and hear the fun and the laughter and the engagement of children just playing. The assessments and the learning will take place as a nurturing school. We know that children need to feel safe um, before they can begin to learn. Its ability, I think, to reflect and celebrate on what really has worked well with it. Well, we've had staggered drop offs for all of our children, but in particularly nursery and foundation, we've dropped them into the playground. This is going to continue for us into the future because it's an opportunity to meet with friends, to have that regulation. And it's really reduced the tears, the attachment and the usual worries at the start of the school day. Parents can meet staff in their way in, way out and it allows that communication. We find also through the play that actually many children sadly are disclosing a lot of information through play. So referrals through to the Child Protection Service, Women's Aid and Unichinis, particularly over the last couple of months, has really, really increased from my part. But again, that's maybe um, again just reinforcing the, the need to have that appropriate play and that appropriate relationship with adult and child. For us too, it's about the staff training. I mean, certainly we have a lot of mental health staff training, well-being, Lego therapy, drawn and talking therapy, nurture, our Elfling, our receptive language, our expressive language. And it's when you have, I'm going to call it that toolkit, it gives then the staff the ability to choose when they're with a group of children, when they're working one-to-one, -one, how do I interact with the child? A little bit like the incredible years. Do you work alongside? Do you guide? Do you observe? Do you intervene with that? And it's a skill of the adult. I love the quote there, I think it might have been from Sharon at the very start there about how it wasn't dictated um, by the mood of the adults. That's so, so important because it plays such a crucial part. We did now have ETI in looking at play during the pandemic and I'm glad to say there's nothing that we didn't know already um, that we want to look at moving forward. But again, I think we have to keep expectations clear that children aren't catching up. We're here to find the gaps in their learning and fill these essential foundations before moving on. We review how we teach and how children learn and we make the adjustments when necessary. We're flexible in our thinking and we're listening to the child. We're clear about our end goal and ensure that we provided that supportive, inspiring environment for children to learn, engage and wonder. So whenever you look, where do you work, Rathcool? I'm sure that's hard. It's not. We talk about children can't bounce off the walls if we take them away. We say that it's easier to teach a child to love and respect our planet and all who dwell in it than it is to deal with the effects of the adults who don't. And bad weather always looks worse through a window. So just finally, the fact is that we need prisons that are more like schools and schools that are less like prisons. But for this to happen, the teacher also needs freedom. So I suppose my challenge today is this. How are you going to look at play from now on? What do you critically need to improve on? But also more importantly, what's working well? How do you share it and how do you celebrate that with others? We've only got one shot at this with many of our children and particularly in the nursery stage. So get on your wellies, get on your waterproofs and get outdoors. And today, teachers in the world of William Wallace, freedom all the way and get going. Thank you very much, folks. Brilliant. Thank you, Emma. Um, yeah, and thank you for that challenge as well. Sorry that that was a whistle stop tour for you, but um, your commitment and your passion for, for play really, really shone through. To finish us off, um, something a wee bit different. It'll literally take five minutes. So we have Julie um, Cohort for, from Sperm View Special School in Dungannon and Glenda from Stranmillis back with us. And once they've finished, then that's us done. We'll not come back for any reflection or questions or whatever. We'll let people go. So um, over to Julie and Glenda. Hello, Julie. Hi, Glenda. Julie, thanks so much for keeping with us uh, in that respect. And can you give us a little bit of a background um, uh, perspective on where you work, etc., please? 
Hi, my name is Julie Court, and um, I'm currently working in Sparenview Special School in Dungannon. Um, I've been there for about 20 years. Um, we're a school that um, provides for children with severe learning difficulties, profound multiple learning difficulties, autism, um, and sensory needs. Um, and I guess um, for we're aged between three and 19. Um, for about the last um, eight years, I've been in the nursery stage. Super, Julie. So um, I'm going to swiftly move on to the fact that during the, the second lockdown, special needs settings remained open. So what challenges and or opportunities did this provide? And how effective was it overall in terms of meeting the needs of the children and their families? So as you can imagine, for our parents um, and our pupils, home learning um, isn't something that was very successful and obviously was very difficult for them. Um, and to ask parents in those situations to become educators and teachers um, also obviously put um, another strain on them and for many of them um, could have been something that would break the camel's back. So um, lockdown for us, uh, for everybody else, obviously arrived in January um, and overnight, I guess, we were the only sector within education um, that were asked to remain open. Um, that was, to be perfectly honest, quite daunting um, as teachers and staff initially, when we um, initially it was nurseries were staying open. And then I think um, on the Thursday evening, whatever, suddenly nurseries were closing too. And you realise that, okay, basically we're the only sector um, that is staying fully open um, for our pupils. Um, I guess one of our main challenges was really staffing at Glenda, to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. Mid Ulster, where we're located, became a COVID hotspot. Um, and often um, the whole risk assessment of class bubbles being able to operate and stay open became a huge challenge because staff were isolating, um, staff had COVID um, mm. and bubbles were literally closed down. Bubbles being a class would have, could have been closed overnight and parents were getting messages and say, so sorry due to staffing arrangements. Also, you must remember that our children are all transported on buses mm -hmm. um, and obviously being on those yellow buses, the bubbles are, are already burst before you even arrive at the school door. So there were instances obviously where um, bus drivers or um, bus escorts also had um, um, COVID or were isolating because somebody else had. So that was huge challenge for, uh, challenges for us, um, but also an amazing opportunity to work as a staff team. To be honest, um, as a parent with um, three teenage kids, um, yes, there was part of me felt, goodness, how am I gonna supervise that they even get up in the morning because it won't be there. But also you see the thing of being able by the third day to realise, ah, I actually get to go to work and see people. Um, there was a real buzz about that. And also the thought of being thankful that I actually can go to work and see other people. And just as a class team, um, to be able to um, build how we work together. And we also came to the situation as a school that we had to begin to operate um, with a reduced number of children in the class. So pupils were provided three days one week and two days the next. So we were open five days, but their provision was a three day, two day, three day, two day, alternatively. Um, and also that, to be honest, provided amazing opportunities because um, the classroom and the school was quieter, which for a lot of our pupils um, is actually more beneficial. And um, there also was more space and more adult intervention. Our space for us, physical space, is a massive problem. And so with COVID, lots of people obviously wanted to be more outside and we've heard the reasons and needs for that and so on. But that became difficult for us in Sparenview as well because we had to timetable our outside spaces. So children who often may have used outside spaces um, for sensory behavioural um, areas or breakout spaces as well, um, that wasn't as flexible, um, which also could create more problems for us. Thank you, Julie. An extremely challenging time, but as always, you rose to the challenge. So then last but not least, how, in your opinion, has the pandemic and its associated restrictions impacted on young children's overall learning and development in special school settings? I think as has been highlighted today, Glenda, um, there was a whole window and a whole opportunity to be embraced and um, basically to learn and move forward and um, whether it was in the area of play or other areas within the school. To be honest, the whole idea of this cleaning and fogging and all the rest of it and the practices that it did bring um, initially was um, was very hype, was very hyped up in school. It was very um, much to the fore. Um, but to be honest, as we quickly realised for us, um, a child arriving on from a school bus, jumping into a staff member's arms, ripping off their mask and licking them from chin to cheek 
um, put very much everything into perspective for us. Um, the whole idea of the learning and development for children, we as a, as a school had already identified in 2018-19 the need for us as special school and particularly in our setting to really um, be to consider our thinking skills and personal capabilities and the requirement for our schools to have a more skill based curriculum. Um, COVID gave us a perfect opportunity um, to look at that. It was a great um, opportunity to review practice, um, to re review curriculum and to basically consider our children and their needs and making sure that they came first and that they didn't become um, square pegs that had to fit into round holes. Um, we did a lot of training um, through Hurstwood and through Barry Carpenter um, and basically understanding um, the needs that our children have and our responsibility to meet them. And we basically rearranged in many ways our curriculum um, around my, my body, um, my communication, my independence and my thinking. Wellbeing became um, very much part of the four. Um, throughout this, obviously, we have involved ATI. Um, and we very much considered as the children came back, the whole idea of the recovery curriculum um, and what our children would need. And that's where we started. Um, we, we considered how do we make sure that they will want to be in school? And um, what is the five star welcome gonna look like when they come back? Um, and play obviously became a massive part of that. Um, it was an opportunity for, for teachers to have a flexibility and permission was given to try new things and new ideas. Um, and now for us, it's the strategic review of moving that forward and how it fits into the bigger picture as we think about assessment and PLPs and so on. For the children themselves, to be honest, they became the focus. Our um, school has the ethos of pupils come first. Um, and just to make that tangible for you, as we considered our children coming back um, in September after the first lockdown, we decided that for them, the best thing would be that the teacher moved with them. So personally for myself, I've been a nursery teacher for the last eight years, but instead of going back to nursery in September, we move with our children. So I suddenly, in the midst of the pandemic, became a P1 teacher. Um, but the children, over their, their needs and what would be best for them, obviously, um, was, was what our starting point was at. And we felt for them the relationships that they already had, for us already knowing them a little bit, it was going to be easier for us to help them fit back into the, the school environment because we knew the structures and routines, we knew their behaviours, we knew their sensory needs, and we knew how we would be able to best settle them back in and move them forward. Wellbeing assessments were carried out. That was our whole focus. And um, when we came back in, a se in September, that was on a daily basis. And um, their IEP was re a recovery IEP. Um, and we built in new things, happiness boxes, sensology workouts, reflex therapy, basically whatever was required to help the child. We did notice a marked improvement. We noticed an improvement in behavior and self-regulation and emo emotional well-being. To be honest, um, just the space to stand back, to watch the child, to observe them, not simply the label that they had attached to them, um, to be prepared to be flexible um, and to work from where they were at and how to move them forward. Um, the boomerang effect now, mind you, is all pupils are back, space is limited, massive issue um, continues for sensory and behaviour, but just the whole learning thing is the pupil comes first and let's focus on them. It was really such valuable words and it's such a, an amazing insight and so good to get that special school perspective. So thanks again for sticking with us. Thank you so much and I'll pass back to Angela. Thank you. Thank you, Glenda. And thank you, Julie. You really did show us that additional layer that I suppose mm -hmm. thank you. some of us don't think about. So yeah, well done. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. We're going to close. We're not going to I'm not going to drag this out any further. Thank you for sticking with us. You will get um, the, the research report sent out to you tomorrow, plus some additional li links that we picked up there in the chat function. So thank you, everybody. Sorry it ran on so long, but we did have so much to say. Um, see you all soon. Thank you.